And uh, all right, everybody, let's get started. We're going to go for an hour. Uh, we will try and wrap up the Q and A, um, uh, or we will try and wrap up in about 40, 45 minutes and leave 10 to 15 minutes of Q and A. Uh, hopefully, uh, uh, hopefully that'll be enough time for you. Our guest today is Morris Lilienthal, a good friend of mine. We uh, participate in a Legal Minds uh, Mastermind group uh, a couple of times a week together. Mo is a personal injury attorney practicing out of Alabama, Huntsville, Alabama, and he is a former football player, former offensive line. Is that right, Mo? That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, and uh, down in uh, Tennessee, at uh, it played for Tennessee. He's been practicing for about fourteen years. He's a great guy, and uh, he's going to give us some great information today on uh, preparing for depositions and a little bit of what you can expect in a deposition. So, if you can uh, hold questions in until or towards the end, or put them in the Q and A, that would be. Perfect. We'll try and get to as many as we can. We did get some questions ahead of time, uh, and we'll uh, we've reviewed some of those, and we'll try and get to as many questions as we can. Uh, hopefully, uh, we're not overwhelmed, but we do have a lot of visitors here with us today. I won't be checking the chat uh, throughout most of the the show because we will have uh, quite a bit of stuff to to get through here. So. Uh, if there is, if that's all the things, Mo, is there anything you'd like to uh, you'd like to uh, share before we get started? Anything that I didn't share? No, I think that's it. Um, I, I do litigation trial work and and been doing this for a number of years now, and have you know experience in retaining experts in various cases and proposing experts in various cases. And, you know, what I would tell you is, you know, I know we probably with looks like over 100 participants, which is awesome. Um, you know, people in various stages of their expert, uh, you know, testimony, background and experience. So some of the things we may discuss may be more, uh, you know, one on one type of stuff. But it's always good to rehear some of these things and remember some of these things, because it amazes me that I'll still see some, you know, kind of rudimentary mistakes that an expert may make in a case that they know better, but they just, you know, kind of forget that, that, that step along the way. And then we'll certainly dive into some more uh, details and some of the, some of the topics. And then certainly at the end, if we've got questions, we'll try to answer any more uh, specifics as best we can. Excellent. And uh, as you and I had discussed in preparation, Mo, uh, I'll, I'll be running the slideshow. So as we get through these, uh, you just, uh, as you finish up with one, just let me know, hey, I'm ready for the next slide, Nick, and I'll go ahead and push the next one forward. Okay. Uh, and let me just make this a little bit more visible for folks. Uh, this is a collaboration between Mo's firm, Martinson and Beeson, and experts.com. Uh, and uh, here's the, uh, here's your first slide, Mo. Uh, just uh, let me know what you need me to do from here on out. Yeah, well, you know, so so folks, you know, the first thing I wanted to kind of talk about, and some of this you'll see will kind of narrow down, is, you know, look at big picture. You know, I'm not sure, you know, how much experience everybody has in doing with testimony. I've had experts that we've retained locally at maybe some universities that may have the skill set or knowledge base to speak to a certain issue that we have in a case, but maybe they haven't been deposed before. Maybe they haven't testified live before. So these are just, you know, kind of big picture things. And again, as I said just a minute ago, we're going to drill down on some of these things. So, you know, big picture things. What can you expect, you know, when you're getting ready for a deposition? Well, certainly your credentials. You know, we're going to talk about that a little bit more in a couple more slides. But, you know, the, the opposing lawyer is going to want to delve into your background and your credentials. And I know we have some questions about some of this already. Um, you know, what have he or she, what have you done education-wise, training-wise, experience-wise, testimony-wise? They're going to want to look at that, and you need to be prepared for that. Um, you know, certainly the next thing they're going to want to talk about the steps of your investigation, meaning, you know, what did you do once you were contacted by retaining counsel as a part of your investigation in this case? And you really need to make sure that you have a good system set up you know, if you're, whether you're working for a company and, and, and they have it, which you may already have it built in, or if you're doing work on your own, have a good system set up uh, for documenting, you know, processes and procedures and the methodology that you're using. That's so, so important because 
you know, we're lawyers and we're, we're, we're going to analyze this thing to death. And we're looking at every step that you're taking. We're trying to find a pitfall there, you know, depending upon the case, you know, we're trying to find something to catch that could help our client on our side of the fence. And whether that is, you know, you forgot to document something and then we can catch you and then figure out, well, maybe, you know, if you don't have the raw data or can produce how you came to that analysis, that could be a big issue in front of a jury. Um, you know, a jury is, you know, again, 12 strangers that don't know you, that don't know the other side, and they are analyzing everything that you're doing. So you really want to document everything you're doing. Remember, you were retained in a case because you were the, literally the expert. So you should be very methodical in all the steps that you're doing to make sure you have the systems in place to document uh, records and things as they come in and, and the stuff that you're doing as you're doing it on, during your investigation. Um, next big picture item, Nick, is, you know, certainly, you know, why you've been retained, right? I mean, right. The, the whole reason you've been retained in this case, uh, uh, whichever side it retains you, plaintiff or defendant, uh, is to render an opinion and give a report. And so, you know, certainly they're going to want to talk about your background and your experience and your qualifications to render that opinion. But then the next big thing is, you know, what is that opinion? How did you reach that conclusion? What's the methodology for getting there? And, you know, what facts are you basing that on? And how does that, you know, affect the ultimate in, in ending in that case, whether you're on planet or defendant? So, you, you know, you get ready to, to get in the trenches on that one because, you know, lawyers going to, we're going to come at you full, full force with guns a blazing on that one as best we can. And then, okay. as long as you're ready, then you're good to go. All right. And that's why you probably analyze and talk about these steps of investigation yeah, is for, or that you have that in your mind because that's what establishes the opinion you've reached. That's right. Yeah. Cause yeah. I mean, you, 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 you can't just be, well, you know, I've done, you know, I've looked at a hundred of these accidents like this or a thousand of these accidents over my course of my years. And I know this is the case. Well, okay. Well maybe that's what you see, but what are the steps that lead you to that conclusion in this case? Gotcha. You know, how did you reach that? What evidence did you look at? What facts did you look at? What, you know, what scene photographs, deposition testimony from witnesses did you look at to reach that conclusion here? So those steps are really important. Excellent. Excellent. Are you ready for the next slide? Yeah, I think so. All right. Um, you know, kind of diving just a little bit deeper, you know, when we're going to look at more what, what, you know, if I'm deposing somebody kind of things that I'm looking for. You know, first thing, uh, biographical information, prior employers, education, you know, organizational licensures publications experience. Okay. What does that mean? Well, look, you know, folks, when, when we're, we're getting ready in a big case, you know, we usually aren't retaining experts in uh, soft tissue cases. Okay. There's usually cases that there are traumatic injuries, deaths, uh, loss of limbs, brain injuries. These are high dollar expensive cases on both sides of the fence, whichever side you're involved on. And when you do that, Lawyers that are involved in these cases are digging deep on everything they're doing. What do I mean? We had a question, Nick, kind of maybe even delve into that a little bit about, you know, uh, somebody has have seen cases where they've gotten my uh, opinions or reports in other cases. They are. What, what lawyers are doing, I can certainly speak from the plaintiff side of the bar, is that's primarily what I practice. When, I, when we are retained and when we are involved in cases and experts are identified, folks, we, we, it is almost an everyday occurrence when some of the national listservs I'm on mm -hmm. for people to ask other lawyers on that listserv, hey, I'm involved in a seatbelt failure case. I'm involved in a tread tire separation case. These experts from these parts of the country have been identified on these various issues. Please let me know if you have deposed them or have any experience with them. And then invariably people will respond, hey, I deposed him or her in this situation. Let me get you their deposition. Let me get you their report. And so we are looking into those things. So certainly, you know, understand that, you know, we're not just taking your credentials at face value. We're not just taking your report in this case at face value. In cases where there are, you know, the stakes are this high that we would retain, you know, experts, we're doing our background work to make sure that we're, you know, cross-checking, dotting our I's and crossing our G's to see what you've done before. So, um, so yeah. that really rolls into your second point about prior testimony and other lawsuits. That's how they're attaining that information. You're getting it from other lawyers who have, who have dealt with this expert before. Yes. And, you know, I, and I can tell you that in, in some aspects of, of uh, you know, I'm sure the defense bar does something similar, but 
there are certain segments we have something called, it's actually based here out of Alabama called AIEG, I think is the, the acronym, but it is for automotive engineering cases and, and products cases. And they basically, it's a hub for deposition and discovery stuff that still allows to be, you know, there, maybe there wasn't some kind of qualification or protective order that would allow it to be maintained outside of the case. And it's a hub for discovery and a certain, you know, maybe Chrysler case or some kind of something like that. But there's depositions and facts and they have stuff in there. So we're looking, you know, at those repositories for lack of a better way of saying it. But what we're doing, you know, and we'll talk about this in a little bit later slide, Nick, is, you know, we're looking at um, your prior testimony too. We want to know. And also to that point, to that little point, something, you know, that you need to understand. And I've got the, I went ahead and pulled the rule book up. That's the uh, federal court, Alabama rules of procedure, but it's got the, the federal rules of civil procedure. And just so most of you know, you know, one thing I would tell everybody is, um, and I was kind of Nick and I were prepping for this, telling him some experiences that I've had where, you know, jurisdictional law can be totally different from one state to another. So just please, please be mindful of that. Uh, that you understand if you're, you know, you're, you may be based out of California, but if you're being brought into a case in New Mexico, you need to check with, with, with retaining counsel to make sure there's not any specifics that would vary from what you, where you're normally, you know, used to testifying and the documents you need to keep and things you need to be producing. I have run into that here in Alabama. We had a, a situation where the law was a little different than the federal rule, uh, caught our uh, expert off guard and it, created some hiccups during, during live trial and we got through it. But if we had done our due diligence, there was kind of lesson learned kind of situation mm -hmm. um, to do. So part of the federal rules of civil procedure, rule 26 sets out a list of six areas that when you, uh, uh, the lawyer retains an expert things that they have to identify. And one of them is that one right there, Nick. And it says um, a list of other cases in which during the previous four years, the witness has testified as an expert at trial or by deposition. So even if you didn't testify by trial, it's important uh, folks to keep up with testimony, deposition or trial. So they should be keeping good records of their previous depositions and previous trial testimonies. Certainly. Yeah. And, and it sounds like, uh, I think what we sort of discussed is the federal rules of evidence are a, a good guide for, because they're, they're really, they've been implemented in a lot of jurisdictions or something very near them. So they're a good guide, but you really do need to check with retaining counsel over uh, what the local jurisdiction requires. Yeah, no doubt. You, you want to find out because th there may be some nuance there uh, about your report or records or something uh, that, you know, may apply. And, and even with the judge, I mean, I know you've, you've all probably seen it. You've, you've had something 99 times out of 10 at 100. You've never had a problem with it, but you get in even in that jurisdiction. But if you draw judge such and such, Look out. He or she may be specific about that. So you definitely want to, you know, make sure you, you speak with the, you know, retaining counsel to ask, have you had any action from this judge before? What's their experience? How do they handle, you know, motions in limine or, or things of that nature regarding your testimony? Excellent. Excellent. And so then some other subjects covered in the deposition is going to certainly be the expert's investigation. That's right. And, and, you know, what did you do? You know, what were the steps, the methodology that you used? You know, what, how did you... How did you begin your investigation? We'll talk about it in a little bit, I think, later on in some of the slides about what evidence you were given, what you reviewed, but certainly, you know, big picture subjects, they're definitely going to talk about, you know, what testing you did, what analysis you did, you know, get, get prepared, not only for what your findings were, but how you arrived at those findings. Excellent. And, and which brings you brings us to our last item here, your opinion. That's a you know, basis for each opinion. So there's probably probably going to be multiple opinions on, on different sub issues that are addressed in, in your report and in the deposition. So you want to have a basis for each of those. Yeah, you, you need to have a, a rationale, uh, uh, um, you know, the facts and, and, and information that uh, allowed you to arrive at that opinion and what you know, what you're basing on, are you basing it upon some best practices? Are you basing it upon some ANSI standards? What, whatever you're basing it upon or some engineering principle, you know, what are, you know, what are you basing that specific opinion on from a scientific standpoint and from a factual, whether it's testimony records that were produced in the case, 
or measurements that maybe you conducted at the scene or of, if you're an accident reconstructionist, measurements that you took at of the, the vehicles or something of that nature. So you definitely need, you know, it's not just big picture. You're going to, the, the lawyer's going to want to drill down, uh, opposing counsel's going to want to drill down on all that. And they'll probably ask you as well about the, your evaluation of the opposing experts report. And yeah, I mean, you know, they're going to ask you if you've ever dealt with that person before. Uh, do you consider them to be reputable? Do they? Do, do, have you seen instances where there was issues with their opinions? Uh, do you do you believe they have the qualifications to, to to testify to certain things? You know, they're looking for you know how can they you know, maybe either discredit what you've got to say, or can, can you discredit what the other opposing expert says? You say this, but our expert, she says this, how do you, how do you juxtapose that? How do you, how do you, how do you, how are you both looking at the same evidence and arriving at two different conclusions? Right. Excellent. And there's uh, here's your fact preparation slide. If I think we, we sum that up, we're about 15 minutes in. So I want to keep us going and leave some time yeah. for questions. Yeah, pl pl please do. I'm long winded. I'm a lawyer. <laughs> okay. Um, so um, yeah. So, you know, look at the jurisdiction you're in, you know, it, you know, some of this is more maybe plaintiff oriented looking back at some of the slides, but, but looking at who you're, you're retained by either way, you're going to be asked to, analyze and be need to be prepared for what your your uh who you've been retained by as a client did wrong or right and, and vice versa right so yeah. you know if, if um if you're a plaintiff's expert or you're an expert retained by the plaintiff's counsel in the case you know there's going to be some questions about what the plaintiff did wrong could they have done something could they have prevented or did they was there some step that they did that caused it and just to kind of this may be a little elementary but just to make sure um, you know, depending upon what jurisdiction you're in, there's going to be some element of either comparative fault or contributory fault. And, and most states have comparative. And what that means, folks, is, is if uh, the jury can apportion fault, they could say that 80 percent of the fault to the defendant, 20 percent to the plaintiff. Maybe they weren't using the product properly, but they still believe that the, the, the injury was caused by a product defect of either design or manufacturing defect. And that, that's what led to it, but maybe because if the plaintiff had followed the instructions, maybe it wouldn't have happened as bad or couldn't have happened. So they may attribute some fault there. But if you're in one of the minority states, which is what the jurisdiction that I'm in, Nick, which is contributory mm -hmm. fault, and what that's here in Alabama is, is if the plaintiff is found to be at fault at all, 1%, 1 iota, the judge instructs them to award a, uh, to return a verdict for the defendant. So certainly in, in these jurisdictions or in a jurisdiction where it's a 50% fault state, where if they can be found to be, the plaintiff's found to be more than 50% at fault, then it's instructed for an award for the defendant. You need to be cognizant of that regardless of the things, because if you're on the defendant side, you're certainly trying to find some fault for uh, that the plaintiff contributed to their own action. Right. So you want to definitely speak with your counsel, the one that who has retained you and find out what, what the rules are in that jurisdiction. No doubt. Okay. Excellent. And, and that sort of, they both sort of, that, that, that sort of runs into your second item here, facts concerning what the plaintiff says the defendant did wrong. So really facts, uh, you kind of want to be aware of facts that either side uh, is thinking the other did wrong. That's right. Yeah. No, no, okay. I think that there's a lot of overlap there. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it, you know, it, and then again, you know, when you're, when you're, if you are, if you are, uh, finding fault on the other party for doing something, then uh, certainly that's going to be an area of critique that the, that the opposing counsel is going to, going to be attacking and, and finding basis for that. So again, you need to be prepared uh, to have your rationale as to why that was. Um, okay. And get ready for that attack. Excellent. And, and, and that brings you to defenses to your opinions regarding the fault. That's right. So, you know, if, if your opinion is that, you know, uh, the defendant crossed or the, the center line and, and struck it in the plaintiff's land of travel. If you're an accident reconstructionist, then you need to be prepared to, you know, discuss the facts uh, at the scene, photographs or factual testimony, something that w w where your opinions are coming from, but to you know, give a basis for that ultimate conclusion that the you know other party crossed the center line in that example. Excellent. All right. So what should they bring to the deposition? Yeah, you know, you and I talked about this the other day. We kind of laughed about, you know, and, and I don't mean by the first the first bullet point that, that you know, if, if you're citing a code book, you need to 
you know, get the Encyclopedia Britannica and bring the whole thing. Okay. But it, it's probably if you are if you are citing to a specific code section that is relevant to your opinion in, in the report, it's probably a good idea to have that specific page or pages section of the code, whatever you're citing, building code, ANSI standards, print it off and done okay. and, and ready to, to be able to do because this, you know, one of the I think a later slide talks about what don't don't use your memory. You, you've got you know records and things there. It's much better to be accurate and, and, and spot on and have that in front of you to read from if you need to or reference. Because you know if if I'm asking you about that, I'm going to be asking you. Well, can you can you tell me specifically what that code section says, right. Mr. Richwain? Can you point me to that? Can you read me that? Because I can assure you, the lawyers got it sitting there with a piece of paper and it's highlighted. And there's some word that they're going to try to get catch you on or do are fine that may help their point or weaken your point. And so you definitely need to make sure you're spot on with that. Okay. All um, right. The next thing, and I think you, you mentioned to me that you've seen this with, with some of the folks in, in your, in, in y'all's work that sometimes people just get busy in, in their business and, and testimony and research. They forget to update their, their curriculum, detail your CV. That's yeah. important. Make sure you keep it up. Um, you know, that's part of the, the disclosures is that you have to give, you know, essentially a CD to everybody to do, um, you know, and, and don't, don't, you don't want to get caught on something easy. And what I mean yeah. by that is, is you, you don't want to have some discrepancy on there that's not accurate and it may have been unintentional, but make sure you know your CD and you own your CD. Yeah. And this is, yeah, you, the experience that we've had is it's a, an 11th hour issue where they actually probably just got done with the, the uh, deposition or the first day of deposition. And, and they say, well, you know, they found a, a C, an old CV of mine on your website. Uh, you know, we rely on members to keep their information up to date. We don't have access to your updated information. So we ask you to send us the most updated. Uh, and, and though it hasn't been, uh, you know, a death knell in, in the case, it, it, it puts them in an uncomfortable position during deposition uh, to explain the differences in this CV versus my, the one I, I have brought that's up to date. That's right. It, 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 you just, you know, look, you're there in a contentious situation. You know, this is a battle. This is an interrogation. And you want to create any less friction you can for your retaining counsel. So Excellent. You keep that thing up. Keep that thing up today. Yep. Uh, and that should be on all your advertisements that may include it. It would be my advice to make sure that that's up to date. This next item I like because you, you brought up a good point when we were pr uh, preparing. You said if there's a product or scene involved, have pictures, diagrams for inspection, et cetera. And your point to this one was you should also visit the scene uh, if there is a scene involved, if there was a scene of the accident, for example. I think that's so important. And, and I can tell you, you know, as a lawyer, I do that. I mean, if, if I'm, if I've got any case that, that I'm beginning to start taking depositions in a basic car accident case, mm -hmm. I want to go to the scene if I've never been to that intersection or do. So I have an understanding of what perspective that the other driver had, have an understanding of the perspective that my client has, and then I can, you know, potentially question the other person on those issues. And if they have some issue with, you know, some obstruction at the scene that printed their view, I can immediately address that because I've been there. Mm -hmm. So the same thing here. So think about this, Nick, from a jury's perspective. If you are, are opposing ex counsel's expert and I have you on the stand and you're giving an opinion about an accident reconstruction or your opinion about a workplace, you know, an accident at, at a plant and you've never been there. Now, Granted, folks, it, it may not even be really relevant to your opinions. Your opinions may not have really a whole lot to do with you having seen the scene. But if I ask you that you're here to testify that, you know, XYZ Corporation uh, was negligent in their duty to maintain the XYZ equipment, which caused Mr. Smith to lose his leg. And I ask you, Mr. Richard, isn't it true you've never even been to that plant? You're here giving an opinion that something happened and you've never even been to the plant, right? I mean, that is just a bombshell because, you know, it's every perspective is everything to the jury. So right. you know, they don't, they don't, you know, before they could ever be told in, in summation or closing arguments that, that that's not really that big of a deal, 
the, the opposing counsel is going to make a big deal out of it. They're going to right. prance around the courtroom, and I can assure you and cross two or three times. And so, again, Mr. Rishrain, you're telling me that this is your opinion, but, again, you still have – make sure I'm right. You've never been to the scene of the accident. You've never been to this plant, and you're giving this opinion. I mean, it, it's going to be a damn ball-peen hammer over your head over right. and over again. Just get it, – it's easy. It's easy. Go check it out. If you're coming into town for – if you don't really need it, have have a council set up an inspection prior to deposition and do it. No, right. All right. And so here are some items you wanted to get. And we've talked about a little bit of it already, but what should they know? What should an expert know going into the deposition? You've got all your code sections. You've got your CV. And you, you mentioned here, know and own your CV. We sort of covered that right. and make sure it's an up-to-date version. So what else should they sort of know going into deposition? Yeah, I mean, it's routine, you know, similar to, you know, what we want to know and from a jury perspective, uh, you know, when we're, when we're talking in front of a jury uh, and for deposition as well, um, to know what percentage uh, you retain by what side of the fence, right? So, right. you know, when you're keeping this list that Rule 26 requires of four years back, I, I would denote who you were retained by, were you retained by plaintiff's counsel, were you retained by the defense counsel. You know, and, and, you know, it's natural sometimes. I know some experts seem to tend to be retained by one side of the fence or the other. Um, and I think, you know, you, you might suggest, and I would too, that you, you don't just do plaintiff's work, you don't do just defense work, because it certainly can skew your, your appearance in front of uh, a jury and a judge uh, that you may be just, uh, you know, a paid, you know. Right, a, hired gun. Yeah, hired gun there. So I think it's good, but that's certainly something you're going to be asked. And I have seen many experts go, well, maybe, I'd probably guess. And, and it's just like, well, this is your profession. You're here. You can't tell me. Again, it's just cr create less friction. Yeah. You know, you're going to have friction or issues are going to be a point of contention. Don't make something that shouldn't be a point of contention. Right. And, and we recommend off, you know, certainly if you could do 50, 50, that would be, you know, the, the best, but you know, 60, 40, at least showing because it keeps your credibility up that I don't just get paid by one side and don't just give them the answer that they want. I agree with that. I, I think it just shows that, Hey, look, I, I'm an expert in, in X, Y, Z, you know, field. And, you know, if somebody calls and retains me, I, I, you know, I can help either way. I'm just going to look at the, the facts and, and I can give you an opinion as to what I think happened or, or what caused what, whether it happens to be, you know, one side of the planet for the defendant that retained me, my, my opinion should not be uh, any different. Okay. And then your last item here, it says, keep the info about how and when you were contacted by the law firm in this case. So that you're thinking from day one, when you get that initial contact, you should keep that, you should have something set up that allows you to track this information. I think so. I think, um, you know, lawyers are always asking one of the first questions is, is you know, Ms. Smith, uh, can you tell us when you were first contacted by Mr. Lillianthal's firm in this case? How were you contacted? I think the next slide talks about you know, what you were asked to do. But just in the general sense, you, you need to know when and how you were contacted by this firm. Because for me, and, and, and for counsel, opposing counsel, that can be important. Were you contacted at the 11th hour? Were you contacted right before a response to summary judgment was due? Mm. And, you know, opposing counsel has, has their own expert, and now you needed to be contacted to brought in to, as almost a hired gun, as you said, to, to just juxtapose the other counsel. Or were you brought in early on? And I don't think that matters. It still may not change your opinions, but there may be a perception there that I could make, try to make something out of nothing. There. So it, a lot of, it sounds like a lot of what you're talking about with the perception, whether it's about that you've never even inspected the scene or you came in really late, uh, that perception could, uh, it, 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 they may use that to affect the, the expert's credibility. I think in, so. Yeah, okay. it's not it's not an admissibility question, really. I think that's more of a credibility question, as we say. A weight, what weight the jury or the trier fact or the judge in a summary judgment, you know, might may or may not give that that testimony. Okay. In our next slide, you uh, you said, uh, what are you likely to be asked in a deposition? You gave about six or seven uh, good uh, good points here. Uh, in their general, uh, again, like you, you had said, there kind of, this is sort of one hundred and one. You could uh, there could be you could be asked couple hundred questions depending on the case I'm assuming so I'm sure. what are uh, what were you asked to do in this case I think you asked that right right up front 
Yeah, I mean, you're going to be asked what you were asked to do. And, you know, the, the general response should be not be, I was asked to find that, you know, this product failed or there was no <laughs> defect in this product. The product, you know, the response is, you know, I was contacted by, you know, XYZ law firm. Uh, I was advised that, that their, uh, you know, Black & Decker had contacted me about a claim that one of their uh, products had failed. I was asked to inspect this for failure analysis to see if I could determine if there was any defect in the uh, product and in order to determine why it failed. Okay. And that's what I was asked to do, in my opinion, is going to be X, Y, Z. Okay, excellent. And and then uh, assuming that uh, council has given them materials, uh, I guess, in this one, so they're going to be asked that question. What were you, what yeah, were you provided? Yeah, because, you know, one of the things that we asked for, there's going to be a subpoena, Duke Stickham, usually, you know, uh, w along with your deposition, as we're going to be asking for production of documents. So we're going to be asking you to bring your file, bring your file to deposition. So I'm going to want to see everything that you've been produced in this case. So that kind of goes back to something early on. You definitely want to be keeping track of all the materials that you were provided, meaning depositions, uh, photographs, document production, all the types of things that you've been provided. Cause I want to know what you've read. Mm. If you have not read something that I may find important, uh, I may start questioning you on somebody's testimony or something. And certainly you want to make sure if you are forming an opinion, you know, and the discovery has not, the, the terms of production or depositions have not been complete. You want to make sure that your uh, retained counsel is continuing to update and provide you additional supplemental discovery. Okay. And, and, and with the materials uh, that you've relied on and form your opinion, is that also part of bringing in the, any literature, any codes, any of that, that, that helped you to form your opinion on the case? That's right. Yeah. If you're providing any code standard standards or codes or uh, things of that nature, then you need to make sure that you've got that and you know that and, and you can, um, you know, speak to how that applies certainly in your opinion. And, and you said, this is pretty, you know, this is big picture stuff because it's going to depend really each case, especially experts is usually facts specific. So. Okay. And, and then they're going to be asked to provide their, their methodology, uh, assuming that this is a, a scientifically relevant methodology. And I've seen it certainly in news stories recently where some, some uh, recent expert uh, opinions had been excluded because the methodology was off. So it, it's yeah. got to be a, a scientifically valid methodology. I imagine. Yeah, it's got to be one that's not some new nuance that has not been accepted in, in a general in the scientific community that generally, unless you're, you know, the first person, you know, that's breaking and you get it through and through, you know, some kind of you know, origination type of first time thing in a court uh, or in a jurisdiction. Um, but, you know, we're going to want to know, I'm going to be want to be questioning you about your methodology. What did you do? What steps did you take in your analysis to do this? If you, you know, if, if you, if you uh, are forming your opinions based upon, uh, you know, some kind of inspection or something in your testimony, what did you do to inspect? Tell me what you did at that inspection. What measurements did you take? Mm. Um, you know, what did you find when you inspected this product? You know, when you went to the scene, you know, what did you see uh, there? What measurements did you take? What photographs did you take? Show me that you're coming to this conclusion based upon this. I want to see that in the records. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to really drill down on you and you need to be prepared for that to walk through each step. Because you're going to be looking for an error in the methodology. I imagine that an error in the methodology, uh, some inconsistency uh, on what you've done. You know, if, if I know what the, you know, certainly I'm going to be looking at and knowing what the, the general accepted methodology or protocol is for what you're testifying about. And if I find some inconsistency there, you give me an example. You can think of it, an example where, you know, a lot of times what I'll do in a case is before I drill down on the specifics in, in, in our case, the case that you've been retained, that the opposing counsel retained you on, I'm going to ask you general principle questions, big picture as it applies to, to what you're here to testify on. So, you know, Mr. Rishwain, you've been asked to testify on this. If you're, if you're, what are the steps that an accident reconstructionist would take to do these types of things? Gotcha. But what steps would a, you know, a, a nurse take when she's preparing to do a count prior to surgery? I'm going to get, I'm going to try to put you in a bubble with the things that I think your own words to what you're supposed to be doing in that situation. And then I'm going to take 
the specifics in this case to see if I can call you out. Okay. Can I find some inconsistency in what the general accepted rule or way you're supposed to do it and what you did in this case? Okay. And then what is the, there's a couple others here and I do want to pick us up a little bit because we've got about 10 minutes left here. The fee arrangement issue. uh, Why is that? Why are you going to be asking that question? Look, I mean, you know, one of the things again for credibility and doing uh, opposing counsel is going to be asking you, you know, how many hours you have in the case, what your hourly rate is, what your retainer is, um, you know, and, and the more the more your the retained counsel has paid you, the more it looks like they paid for your opinion. A right. quick funny story: um, uh, we were in trial, it was probably a couple of years ago, and uh, opposing counsel, I, I put my expert on, and opposing counsel was crossing my expert, and he says, "You know, Mr. Smith, this is." Now, how much do you make an hour and how many hours? How much does Mr. Lilithal build you, you know, paid you and all this stuff? He sits down and I sit up and I said, Mr. Smith, uh, the hourly rates and things that I charge you, is that very similar to the same things that you charge Mr. Jones when he retained you in other cases? And so we all had, the jury had a good chuckle because he had used the same expert before and paid him the same rates. So it totally just kind of washed away, you know, any, any cloud of, you know, I'm, you know, hard gun here. I mean, right. same expert. But it's just something you need to know. And the other thing with that is, is how many hours you're billing and doing. I'm looking at how much time you're spending on the file. If there's a real voluminous document production and you're telling me in deposition that you've reviewed all these documents, does your time charter billing stuff match up with that? Gotcha. Yeah. And in our, in our experience, the other item that you deal though, you know, if they find the expert through experts.com where we don't mark up the billable hour, (laughs) you know, it, then, then you should know what you're billing, what your fee, fee arrangement with the attorney is because you've done it. If they're going through a broker, uh, you may not know what you're charging or what the markup on each billable hour is. And we've heard that that will go to affecting credibility. Or we know that that will go to affecting credibility because they'll, why don't you know what you're charging and what you're getting? Right. So, and then the question, do you do any other kind of work? Uh, this, it sounds to me as though you're the attorney questioning an attorney would be asking, you know, are you a full-time expert witness or do you do other work? And this is just a part of what you do. Yeah, I think so. And and like you indicated earlier that, you know, it's certainly helpful. And sometimes you don't have a whole lot of control over it, but, but you know, how much you retain by one side versus the other, this is an appearance thing. Uh, You know, are you actively invaded in some research? Do you do any university work? Are you doing any lecturing? Are you doing any research work still? Even if it's a small percentage of your time, if you're somewhat of retired from your original profession, um, it's always helpful. It it gives you some legitimacy, shows that you're still actively engaged in in that community in one aspect or another. So, um, you know, be prepared to that and address, you know, if if you are doing something else. Okay. Excellent. And then this, uh, do any of your opinions in this case contradict any of your uh, prior opinions in other cases? Sounds like uh, this is going back to that where they find this information out. They've looked at previous depositions because they may be looking to say, well, you know, in in such and such a case, you actually, uh, your opinion stated this. That's right. So, you know, but the, you know, again, understand, you know, folks, if if you're testifying that, you know, a lot of this is fact specific. So, you know, there may be a very well reason that the facts in this case versus that case are different. Um, and, and don't be afraid, you know, if you get called or questioned on something like that, hey, I mean, I can't remember what I had for lunch yesterday. So, and, and most lawyers, if, if you call their office, you're not going to remember half their clients that are active clients. So don't feel bad if you don't remember the Jones v. Smith case from five years ago. Some lawyers called me out on its specifics. You know, ask them to show you specifically what it is or what the facts are. And hopefully that'll jog your memory or take a break and let, allow you time to review that material. And then you may have a very logical explanation as to why that is. That's okay. so just to make sure you, you, you're well informed as an expert as to what they're trying to call in question. Excellent. And so then brings us to what you should ask the attorney. And I'm, I'm assuming you mean the retaining attorney in this situation. Yeah. So, you know, if, if you're reviewing something, do you need additional information? Is there something you're missing in that case that would really help, you know, sense your opinion or confirm your thought process or just as imp- could be just as importantly, is there something out there that would help eliminate some attack from opposing counsel that could quash some possible de- 
defense to your your opinions or some attack to your opinions. So make sure that you know if, if you're if you need something else or ask your retaining counsel, hey, I've got all this. Is you know I don't see anything in the file about X. Gotcha. You know you know what you know when this has happened. You know if it's if it's a failure case, I don't see anything about you know, the prior ownership of the vehicle before Mr. Jones owned it. I can, is this a, was he the original owner of the car or was this car bought secondhand to know that there may be something else that another owner could have had something with that vehicle that could have, you know, possibly caused some issues. So, you know, if, there's, if you've got something that you don't, you want to know, ask, ask retaining counsel if, if it's out there available. Okay. All right. And uh, in addressing uh, negative aspects, you want to do that up front. Yeah, you know, I, you know, I'm a big believer, and I think a, uh, a lot of folks that that I hear from, you know, don't, don't let it come out from the other side the first time, or be prepared to address it. If there are negative aspects in in, in retain counsel's case, you know, bring it up. I mean, and, and be prepared to address them. But they may not even be applicable. We had a case several years ago, Nick, where um, our client was working on a roof, uh, doing construction work, and there was an open skylight. Sadly, she fell through and, and, and died. Mm -hmm. um, but she had had marijuana in her system. Well, you know, that's that's where they're hammering because they were certainly in violation of OSHA standards. Mm -hmm. So, but that was a negative aspect of our case that we needed to be prepared to handle, that our experts needed to be prepared to handle that, you know, whether she was, you know, whether that was in her system and had any effect or not, I didn't change the fact that that skylight was in violation of standards. And, never, and if it had been covered, she could have been smoking you know, marijuana at the time that she wouldn't have fallen through. So gotcha. be prepared for those negative aspects. Okay. And let's do, let's run through some testimony. Maybe we can choose the ones you think are most important here and, and try and wrap up here in a couple of minutes to take yeah. some questions. Sure. I mean, you know, some of these are pretty easy. The first couple, you know, don't, you know, get, when you give an answer, you know, give, give the positive answer. Don't, don't, um, don't make, well, I think this could be the case, or maybe this is good. Don't give any wiggle room. If you, if you have a basis, you have an opinion based upon all your research and investigation, your methodology, and the facts in the case, be firm about it and stick to your guns. Okay. Because you, you may get asked that question, you know, two or three different ways and in different may, in scenarios. Apply the facts, and if that's the case, you've got to stick to that because you do not want to give any wiggle room to opposing counsel for something, uh, most for some judgment standard or, or most for some judgment stage or at trial for them to wiggle around or for their expert to be able to take something and use against you. That, that is really, really important. Um, you know, again, don't, you know, don't rely on your memory. You know, you can use your documents if you, you've got notes or highlights or something or whatever. Like flags, take flags and flag certain deposition testimony you think may be important that may be questioned at trial or at depositions. And then the other thing is, you know, I see this with, with witnesses and with even with, I've seen this with experts over the years. Don't lose your cool. Keep your cool. I mean, you know, people are going to get heated. This is, a, this is a, again, this is an interrogation. But don't lose your cool. Be respectful. And what I always tell my clients, and I tell witnesses too, even if you're 60 years old, and it's a young 30-year-old lawyer on the other side, say yes, sir, yes, ma'am, that mm. kind of thing. I just think it reads well uh, when uh, judges reading transcripts or it's read out loud. Uh, that's just you know, maybe a Southern thing, but uh, that's just kind of, that's just, I think it, I think it's just, you know, being, being the safe way to do it. Excellent. And then you have some items to review carefully before deposition. Yeah, and, and, and a lot of these kind of cross over, Nick. We talked about that. Yeah. You know, I, I think you know what I think is good. Good practice for lawyers. I think this is a good practice to, to ask the retaining counsel, "What's the jury charge on my on the, on the opinions and facts of the, the part I'm testifying about? What is the jury going to be charged on my testimony? What are they going to be charged on the standard of care? And so that, these are things that I want to know that I, and even if I've handled a case like this. I routinely, I had that come up the other week. I had somebody, a client asked me about something and I, I walked over here to my bookshelf and grabbed the jury charge and read the jury charge and then spoke to them about that. I mean, that's, at the end of the day, that's the law as, the, as far as the jury is concerned and right. how they're applying that law to, to, to your testimony. 
So that goes for your standards of care, your negligence, your defective, uh, anything like that. The proximate cause, uh, we call them jury instructions in California, unless that's been changed since years ago when I was in a law firm. Uh, but jury charge, jury instruction, essentially the right. same thing, right? Yeah. That's right. Okay. In, in that, basically, does that sum it up? I don't want to rush too much here. I know that's essentially our last slide because the next one is, who you, you know, here's how they get in touch with you. But did, did I rush you too much there at the end? I do have, I see that questions are, are piling up. So I wanted to get to them. Yeah, I think that's it, Nick. I mean, you know, you know, expert testimony is, is very critical in a lot of cases. You know, if you're in a medical malpractice case, you know, in, in Alabama, you know, essentially, unless it's a, an instrument left in, 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 in the person, you got to have, you know, expert testimony. So experts are vitally important and a lot of the cases that we we pursue and a lot of cases that, that you know defense lawyers are defending and it's it's you know make sure that you know your nuts and bolts of what's going on don't miss any of these easy points document everything and, and do and then you know just get ready and you know if you've got questions and I would prepare I mean I really really do don't don't you know if you've got deposition tomorrow in a big case you hadn't picked up that file in two months if you wrote your because a lot of times you know from a discovery standpoint your reports do it may be some other time in the future before months down the road before you're deposed so make sure you've reviewed everything and done because I'm sure you they should the lawyer on the other side should be well prepared excellent so let's get to some questions by people uh, you've got the information there on how to get in contact with mo uh, we will also uh, post some stuff at the end we have some let me get to the beginning questions uh, norman asks when do you have to provide raw clinical data to an attorney and the court i saw that um i think that's going to be maybe uh case specific uh jurisdictional specific and if it's uh psychological records or, or those kind of mental evaluations and things like that. There may be some type of privileges on that uh, based upon the case law in that specific jurisdiction. So if, if you've got uh, that kind of issue, I would ask retaining counsel on that, um, especially as it pertains to psychological records. I know we have some specific case law here that may limit production and all those kinds of things. Um, but generally speaking, most things under Rule 26, if you were an identified expert, are fair game. So, um, you know, they may ask for that specific production. Um, you know, one, one of the things that, that you and I talked about uh, uh, beforehand that I kind of touched on a minute ago, not directly, was the federal rules. And now most jurisdictions, Alabama now is included. It wasn't a few years ago, was an expert can rely upon evidence or data that's generally relied upon in that field of study to form their opinions, even if that documentation is not produced uh, at trial or in the case. Um, but you may be asked to produce, there may be a specific request for production for that or part of your deposition notice. Uh, and if it's something that you think is potentially privileged, then you're going to need to speak to retaining counsel on that to see what the jurisdiction says in your case. Excellent. Uh, Tracy says uh, she'd like to get a copy of the PowerPoint presentation. Uh, I've seen that this has come up a couple of times in the question. Tracy, we're actually going to go ahead and put, we're recording this, it'll be up on YouTube and uh, you will be able to refer to it on YouTube probably by the end of the week. Uh, it should be up and, uh, and all the information will be there. Mark asks, uh, I've had a deposition after submitting a report in which the opposing lawyer would not allow me to have a copy of my report to refer back to. Uh, he says he's always been asked not to bring anything to a deposition, but the opposing lawyer wouldn't let him refer to his report. And uh, it, he said it does mostly patent cases. So maybe that's a issue in the patent court, but that's, it does seem strange to me. Yeah, I, I've never, um, you know, normally w w when I'm involved in these cases and, and, and opposing counsel does the same thing and, and for general sense is we, we're going to introduce your report as an exhibit to your deposition. I'm going to have a copy and you're going to have the copy we've marked and I'm going to walk through it with you and, 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 and go through each opinion and go through a lot of the steps that we just talked about and do, you know, maybe, <laughs> maybe somebody's trying to give you a memory test or do to do that. Um, you know, I think if, if that is 
the situation and, you know, and you're not allowed to refresh your memory by having the report in there. I mean, I think I would use that as a crutch to say, you know, these are my opinions you do, but you know, if you would allow me, sir or ma'am to have my report, I could specifically address that. But you know, this is my recollection of everything. Here's why I did this and that. Here's what my findings were. But I, um, I think, uh, you know, just be straightforward with it. Okay, excellent. Michael asks uh, some thoughts on deflating the antagonistic atmosphere of depositions with opposing counsel. I like to view opposing counsel as potential future clients, so reducing that tone seems part and parcel of doing so effectively. Is that, uh, would you, I mean, so in some instances, it's going to be difficult to, to deflate the tone because they're trying to zealously represent their client. What are your thoughts on that? Well, you know, I don't, I never encourage my clients or uh, my experts to be buddy buddy with the other side. It is weird. And again, you, I want you to be professional. I want you to be courteous, but it's an interrogation folks. I mean, they're there to attack your client. If it's a if, if party deposition or you as an expert to address your opinions and to try to critique them or discredit them in any way, shape or form. And if I it, it, give you an example, so, um, you know, I've had experts just like that case I mentioned earlier, but I've experts that, that I have used and I've got one that's evaluating a case for me right now. And I had used her previously, uh, in the first years. And then it just happened to be, I've been against her in two or three other cases, but I, I she has shared with an express me. It's very professional to her, but boy, I went tooth and nail with her in, in some of her opinions and thought I did a good job of discrediting some of the things she was saying. And even after the fact, she, she, she told me that after the case was over. And I think, you know, if you're wanting to get more business, I think as long as you're professional and you're good with what you do, I'm going to respect that. I'm going to be like, oh man, Nick is, man, he's a tough cookie. Mm -hmm. And uh, you did a great job. And, and if I've got a case like that in the future, um, and, and to give a, another example, when lawyers, we, we not only ask other lawyers for information about these experts that may have been produced in a case, if we have a need for an expert, we'll ask other lawyers on a listserv or send out emails, but it's not uncommon that I see somebody say, Hey, I saw this person was retained by opposing counsel in another case that I had and did a tremendous job. You may want to contact them um, because more they were sharp and they knew their stuff. Excellent. Excellent. And I apologize, everybody. We have a ton of questions here. Uh, so we're trying to get through as many as we can. Uh, if, we don't get through them all today. We are going to probably, it'll be next month or December, we're going to have another deposition related uh, webinar with a, uh, a lawyer slash chiropractor, uh, another mutual friend of Mo's and mine, who is both an expert witness and a lawyer, uh, where we'll cover some more of this information. Uh, Mitch asks, uh, do you ever not ask a question during deposition and instead save it for trial? If so, why or why not? Oh, yeah. I mean, you certainly, you know, if it's the old, the old card game, you know, you want to, may not want to hold your cards tight to the vest and not show all your cards. You know, uh, I have seen that play out in and out. I, I was in a, I was, it was in my third year of law school and went and watched a really big products liability trial in the firm I was working with. And it was a seatbelt case against General Motors. And, uh, it was obvious that our that the guy I was clerking for uh, expert had made a huge mistake uh, in opening statement. Opposing counsel said, "Exhibit number 23. I want you to remember this exhibit." And it was a picture of their their retractor retention uh, thing, the ex the seatbelt. They come to find out our darn expert, the guy I was clerking for, I wasn't a lawyer at the time, had had taken a picture and represented that to be the ex the the seatbelt at issue, and it was the passenger side seatbelt. So, I mean, when we find, you know, if we find something or we see, that's a, a real extreme example, obviously. Sure. But, but if we see something we think we can call you on, we may save that, you know, or, or and save that for mediation, let's say, you know, when we're in mediation and, and I'm, I'm trying to do, and, and there's a back and forth between the mediator about causation or, or, or fault. And, and then I'm able to say, well, I'm not so sure about this. I think we may have X, Y, Z that may be able to prove it and that could change you know, each side's position on that, uh, and certainly for trial as well. 
Okay. All right. Yeah, that is an extreme example, but a good example to sort of highlight how uh, uh, it, Louise asks, are text messages, and thank you for all the questions, Louise. Sorry, we don't have time to get to all of your questions. Are text messages via phone discoverable to the other side? Uh, isn't it advisable to write as little as possible even for her own side or for her own notes uh, so they can't be turned over to the other side? Yeah, I think that's a good general principle. Uh, you know, typically, what you know, when we, if I'm sending a letter to an expert with documentation or evidence, it is very short. Dear Miss Smith, find and close. Boom, 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 boom. There's no commentary. There's no dialogue about what I think about them or what's in them. And, and do and I agree? I, I really want to limit written correspondence to my experts to a barest minimum. And I do think. Any correspondence, text or otherwise now, as you know, as the medium is changing and how we're corresponding with people, I think that would be fair game as well um, if somebody wanted to press on that uh, to try to get to get that information. Uh, typically, what I like to do is just to set up a phone call to go over every day, you know. Okay. Dear, dear Bill, here's all the information, and then I'll have my office call to make sure he received it, and then go ahead and set up a conference call to go over everything. Excellent. Wendy asks, in response essentially to our, our discussion of uh, going to the scene, uh, you know, reviewing the scene, uh, she said, if seeing the scene is important in some cases uh, where medical testimony is involved, is it equally important to have seen the patient in question? Uh, and what if a judge won't uh, grant an exam? There could be a case um, where, you know, maybe if you're if you're a consulting expert in a, in a medical case or, you know, I've seen cases where um, we had a, a client that suffered an injury in a product liability case and was claiming that he had a uh, breathing problem related to his front of nerve being hit by this power washer. And um, they requested and was ordered by the court for an IME for a pulmonologist to inspect my client to evaluate whether you know, he believed that his current breathing issues were related to the accident um, as opposed to his you know, prior smoking history. So, you know, it may be a situation that, you know, if you were doing, you know, a, a chart review or something of a person's current condition, that it may be helpful for you to do that. And, you know, the flip side of that is this, right? Think about this, Nick, it's similar to the scene you flip the strip on. If you say, well, you know, if, if you're being deposed and they ask you, you know, have you ever seen Miss Smith or you've only looked at the records, hadn't you? How could you do this? You've never laid hands on her when her treating doctor says this. Well, what if you were able to counter that with saying, well, we asked for an independent medical evaluation of Miss Smith and you guys declined. Oh, wow. Now that certainly sounds totally different. Okay. Excellent, excellent information there. That does sound that does sound totally different. Uh, Fred Frederick asks, uh, he's noticed a new trend, uh, and just sort of wants your comments on this. And sorry, everybody, this will probably be the last question we get to. His trend is he used to be asked, "What are my opinions?" and then they would query him on each one. Now he's asked, "Is it your opinion that?" And they'll ask it over and over again, and rarely ask what his opinion is. So it's sort of just a differentiation in the way they're asking it. Is, uh, you have any comments on that as to why that might be a, a new trend? Well, first thing, the way you phrase that is is it, that allows the lawyer, the, the opposing counsel, to qualify your opinions, right? Okay. As opposed to me asking more of an opening question, you know, uh, Frederick is. Can please give me your opinions based upon everything in this case. If I say, Frederick, is it your opinion that da 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 da, I am now kind of boxing or shaping your opinion. So if that's the case, then you definitely want to be really keep your ears open and make sure that you're listening to what how they are qualifying your opinions based upon your report or your prior testimony earlier in the deposition. Excellent, excellent. Uh, and and I want to thank everybody for coming today. I'm going to put Mo and how I put your information back up on the screen. Mo, tell everybody how they they can get in touch with you. Uh, and for those, uh, in just one second, and and for those who had a lot of questions, sorry we didn't get to them all. Uh, we will email everybody about our next upcoming uh, webinar. It will also be similar. Uh, it's similar in content, but it will be from a lawyer slash expert witness, a chiropractic expert witness. So, <clears throat> so some of the techniques and questions may be the same, 
check back in for that. Mo, how can people get in touch with you? Yeah, well, thanks, Dick. I really appreciate the opportunity and I appreciate everybody um, jumping in. And, and I can tell you who, who you're thinking about having on here is going to do a great job. He's a great guy, a great lawyer, and has a medical background training too. So that'll be a really cool, unique aspect for him. Yeah, I'm, I'm located here in Huntsville, Alabama. I'm licensed in Alabama. I'm licensed in Tennessee. I've handled cases all over as far as Afghanistan. Can you believe that I had a case in Afghanistan uh, involving a military base um, where people were injured? We had experts in that case. Um, but yeah, my email address is on there, Morris at martinsonandbeeson.com, or you could just Google my last name. There's not, not any more more slowly involved that are lawyers out there. Uh, I'll show up and you can come go to our website and go to my profile, my email address, and all that information's out there. Uh, we'd be glad to, to try to help any way I can if anybody's got any questions. Excellent. I, I appreciate that, Mo, and I really do appreciate you taking your time with us today. And I uh, uh, thank everybody for being here. I'm going to stop sharing the screen now and uh, appreciate you all for being here. And we'll uh, shoot out an email with our with the uh, with the next uh, upcoming uh, webinar. Thanks again, everybody. Mo, thanks. Appreciate it. And I will see you tomorrow afternoon. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Bye bye.